lucidity transform through your dreams. I'm Ryan Hurd. I'm a dream researcher and educator, founder of the Dream Studies Portal, author of several books on dreams and nightmares, and today we'll be talking about sleep paralysis. It was actually my introduction into Extraordinary Dream is when I was 14 years old. Uh, and uh, I did not go quietly into extraordinary experiences. In fact, it started off as a terrible nightmare. Uh, in, in the nightmare, there was the phone ringing ominously. I pick up the phone and a voice says, Darkness rules! And I'm just absolutely terrified and I wake up in a sweat. And I settle back down into sleep. But then suddenly I feel this tremendous pressure on my chest and on my neck and I realized that whatever was on the phone was now holding me down and I could actually feel the evil on me, holding me down. And I was going out of my mind because I knew I was awake. There was no doubt about it. I was you know, thinking clearly. I was in my bedroom, I was looking around, but I couldn't move a muscle and I couldn't even scream. That is the classic experience of sleep paralysis. Now, what happened to me that time and maybe it won't work for everyone, but what happened for me is I remembered someone saying that love can conquer all. Really cheesy. Uh, but what I did is I focused on someone that I had a crush on. Uh, I'm 14 years old, you know, schoolboy crush. And when I did that, the feelings of evil just kind of melted away. And suddenly I could move again and I was awake. And that broke through the paralysis. So that was my introduction into, into sleep paralysis. Um, and as it turns out, that's a really common way of getting into it. And for most people, it only happens once or twice in their life. Some people suffer more. Um, and if people who have, have narcolepsy and sleep apnea and other kinds of you know, sleep conditions like that, they can have sleep paralysis as a symptom quite a lot, and it can actually be um, very devastating for them. However, if you're a lucid dreamer and you're really beginning to explore lucid dreaming and sleep disruption and you're using you know, um, galantamine or some of the other kind of supplements, uh, you're beginning to trigger sleep paralysis just because that's part of the process. And so sleep paralysis mastery is actually essential to knowing how to get deeper into lucid dreaming. Uh, and, and it's really an, an excellent opportunity. And the way I think about it is that when you're in sleep paralysis, you're stuck in a threshold. And so the goal is to get through that threshold and into the dream world. So real quickly, we're just going to review what are the main you know, symptoms of sleep paralysis. It's that feeling of pressure on the chest, you know, waking up, feeling like you can't move. That's the actual muscle paralysis. What's happening? This is totally natural. It's actually biological. You know, you're in a kind of, kind of REM sleep. And when we're in REM sleep or dreaming sleep, our muscles are paralyzed. So we don't like swashbuckle our you know, sleeping partners when we're living out some kind of pirate fantasy. sleep paralysis, the body is asleep, the mind is awake, and you realize, I can't move. This is the thing you need to remember when you're in sleep paralysis, the number one thing. This is natural, and I am not in a position of being harmed. This is just a biological hiccup that comes with the stages of sleep. That is the, you know, the medical definition of sleep paralysis. Okay, but of course it gets a little crazier than that, you know, and this is where, and where the hallucinations come because you, after all, you are dreaming with your eyes open. And you don't just dream about buttercups or, or you know, um, celebrities when you're in sleep paralysis. Rather, it seems to, to trigger into that intense fear that you experience as well as this, you know, some of the time this, this sensed presence that comes out of nowhere. And this is, by the way, across you know the board all around the world cross-cultural throughout history people have written about you know written poems about drawn on cave walls strange entities coming and hovering over them while they are reclined There's something very unique and I would say that that's a neurobiological constant other people have different interpretations on that but for me that's the calling card of something that's innate to our bodies and in our cognitive faculties in our mind 
something we've been doing, I'd say, for 50,000 years, maybe even longer. So when you dream with your eyes open and see paralysis, this is called a hypnagogic hallucination, or hypnagogia for short, which means leading into sleep. Now, of course, this can also happen on the tail end of sleep, in which case it's known as hypnopompia. But in sleep paralysis, if you just call it a hypnagogic hallucination, that's pretty much everyone knows what you're talking about. When you have the sensed presence, and you combine the sensed presence, that feeling that something is in the air, and that combines with your fear, and then that combines with a hypnagogic hallucination, then you have what is called the intruder where you know, there's actually an entity, a spirit, you know, something becomes formed that stands over your bed or sits next to you and is actually a vision, right? You know, and I think you know, vampire myths come from this, as well as so many ghost stories that, that occur when people are just waking up out of sleep. So you have three forms of the hallucination. You have the sensed presence, then you have the intruder, which is the actual scene manifestation and then what's known as the incubus and this is when the vision actually you know physically interacts with us um, and and for most people this is the horrible nightmare this is the you know the old hag that 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 sits on your chest and drools on you or maybe like you know takes hold of your neck people have really terrible experiences including uh, sexual molestation uh, and this is also something that's been noted cross-culturally throughout time. Sometimes it's just about being held down, and sometimes there's this, this sexual element to it, this supernatural assault, as it's known. Why it's important to know these three stages of the hallucinations is because you can really have a different way of working with them at each three of these levels. Just like lucid dreaming, what you bring, your set, you know, uh, your positive expectation, what you bring in the moment can co-create the dream around you. So when you experience the presence and you feel that spike of fear, something is in the room with me right now, you can work on and tell yourself, I'm experiencing sleep paralysis, I cannot be harmed. And you can work on a positive expectation that someone who's coming could be here to help you or to heal you. And the reason I say this is not just some sort of wishful new age fantasy. Uh, they're actually based on some ancient dream practices that go back to ancient Greece. The Asclepian tradition, which goes back 2,000 years, 3,000 years actually. And these people would actually sleep in a sleep sanctuary to bring about dreams of the god Asclepius and his consorts and they'd come with an ailment you know they come with some kind of cure or some sort of ailment that could not be fixed by by normal medicine something usually that was chronic and painful sexual dysfunction back pain um, chronic coughs that just would not go away. So people would really, who were really suffering, would come to these Asclepian sanctuaries. They would lay down on a stone couch, by the way, on their backs, which is just how people experience sleep paralysis today. And then after a series of meditations and staying awake all night and cleansing for days on end, and eating only healthy foods, they would come to sleep on these clients and they would incubate a dream of Asclepius to come. And I'm convinced that half of the time, this was a sleep paralysis hypnagogic hallucination of a, of a God manifestation that came to heal them. And it was positive ex expectation that brought that, that healing power. So think about that. And the next time you feel the sensed presence, it's very easy to go right back into, oh no, it's a ghost. But if you can, if you can remind yourself and set an expectation that this could be someone to to heal me. This could be my ally. This could be my spirit guide. Uh, it at least opens up the possibility for such things to occur. Now things get different when the intruder manifests and it might not be who you expected and you might have a new range of fears and it might be something that's very challenging to look at. And this time it's time to, to think about 
I call it courage and compassion. <clears throat> you can no longer, you know, manifest what you want, and you need to basically deal with the moment at hand if you choose to be in this moment. Because as you know, in sleep paralysis, you can wake up at any time. So if you can think about courage and compassion and decide to be in this moment and look lovingly and have love and trust in this relation, you can have an interesting exchange occur. And, and, and again, this is not a new age fantasy. This is, this is based on, on ancient practices <clears throat> and it's worked for me and many people that I know. For myself, I once had a sleep paralysis experience in which an entity appeared and I realized that it was the woman who had died in this very room that I was sleeping. I was sleeping at my in-laws house and it was my, my fiance's grandmother who had passed away 10 years before and her presence was looking at me and that freaked me out. I'm not going to lie, it freaked me out. And I focused on courage and compassion and when I did so, she began to communicate with me and it was telepathic it was there was no words and i i thought back to her i said show me and as soon as i had that that trust to go with her for her to show me uh, i was you know lifted into a dream and went on sort of a visionary journey uh, that lasted many minutes and, and, and it's impossible to describe it was an incredible one of the most incredible experiences of my life so courage and compassion for the intruder. Now, when the intruder is, too, when your fear spikes and it's too much to handle, again, right? <clears throat> you can wake up out of sleep paralysis and there's methods for doing so, like wiggling your toe or blinking your eyes, you know, actually breaking the bodily paralysis. What works for me is blinking, just blinking until I actually physically wake up and then I get out of bed and I wash my face. So the last stage of the incubus is when you're actually being, you know, throttled by the throttler or Pygmalion or the hag or whatever sort of mythological beast has decided to grace you with their presence on this day. There's, you know, a different kind of skill set we're developing here. Um, compassion is no longer appropriate for the task at hand. Courage still is though, and you have a choice. You can decide to sort of ride it out see where it goes or you can try to wake yourself up but don't fall into victimhood and this is the one thing i say if you feel like you're being victimized you need to get out it's not good for anybody to be victimized however one of my favorite dream workers robert moss talks about in one of his books and in interviews about how he once had a sleep paralysis entity this is this disgusting hag who was essentially raping him he was 14 or 15 years old and he decided to ride with it because despite the fact that he was horrified and disgusted he was also sexually aroused which is just one of the weird things about sleep paralysis when he stuck with it and he rode with it uh, she turned into a, a beautiful woman and he experienced ecstasy and woke up into a new kind of dream with new possibilities so there is something to be said about that kind of courage however if you have a history of child abuse um, or anything that gets triggered, you know, uh, some kind of trauma can get triggered. It's, it's a good thing to get out in these situations. Now we're going to talk about methods of using sleep paralysis to roll into lucid dreams or out-of-body experiences. They're actually they're very similar in both of these techniques. Because remember, sleep paralysis is like getting stuck in the threshold. We want to move through the threshold. Number one thing, have your affirmation. I'm in sleep paralysis right now. This is normal. This is natural. Or however, you know, feels, feels good to you. Two, know your intention. Once you've calmed yourself, you're grounded yourself, what do I want to do now that I'm in sleep paralysis? And it's best to have this intention set before, just like in lucid dreaming, that you can remember uh, so in the moment you can just jump straight to it. I want to have out-of-body experience. I want to go through a portal and see where it takes me, that kind of thing. And three, in case the going gets rough, you want to know 
who's your ally? And I, again, would take some time thinking about this before going to bed. Who are some people or some spiritual figures, someone that you respect, admire, something that you can think of as a guide or an ally to, to, to call upon or, or to feel their strength in case you need to do so. It's always helpful to know that someone's got your back when you're facing, you know, terribly toothy monsters that happen to be coming into your field with sleep paralysis. So let's let that all go. Let's just imagine that you just went back to sleep. You're doing a wake back to bed. You know, you did some middle of the night meditation maybe, or you've been reading some books on lucid dreaming. You're shifting back down to sleep with your head elevated on a pillow like you do. You're drifting back down. You're intending to have a lucid dream. And no, you get the shock. You feel the paralysis. Maybe you hear the hear some strange noises. I know I'm in sleep paralysis. Here's how to have an out-of-body experience. I have two methods, both of which have worked for me. The first one is to focus your intention on your navel, right below your belly button. Just focus your intention there for a moment or so, and then try to sort of pull your body up from that point. So imagine your consciousness being at that point. And you might feel a tugging sensation there and nowhere else. And if you feel that, then you're, you're doing it right. And then just try to get up out of bed. You won't be able to if you're in paralysis. And when you do so, and we've got that focus on your belly, the out-of-body experience happens quite naturally for some reason. And you might even feel a pop you know, when you actually you know, leave your body. And, and then you can go about and, and experience that realm. The second method is to focus your intention right here on your third eye, right? You know, between your two eyes. And again, sort of a one-pointed concentration for a moment or two. And this time, try to do a sit-up, like sit up in bed rather rapidly right after doing that. Similar effect. You'll try to do so. Your physical body will not be able to do so. And you'll just have that phenomenal break from that, you know, that body consciousness. So those are two methods that have worked for me, and I think their variations is the same thing. It takes basically a focused piece of meditation, focused on the body, and then an abrupt move that confuses the somatic system, and then you create that, create that out-of-body experience. It's pretty similar with lucid dreaming as well. You want to have a lucid dream. You don't want to be in sleep paralysis. For myself, what works is to just close my eyes and to make a strong intention that I want to be somewhere and to try to be there. And basically not say, I'm going to be there, I want to be there, but rather, when I open my eyes, I'm going to be at this place. Uh, it'll work. And if it doesn't work, you might end up someplace else that's spontaneous. Some other times, what works for me is just to close my eyes and look for the imagery, look for the little bits of pixelated color that kind of move around. That can be fascinating. And if you're fascinated in sleep paralysis, if you're curious, that will dissolve your fear. Just start focusing on the imagery. You'll stop thinking about everything else. You'll get in the flow again. And before you know it, you'll be in a dream. The dream will literally you know, recrystallize around you. And one of the things that I've always liked to do is to look at the imagery and will a portal to appear and you know what will happen is the grains of cosmic dust will just start to swirl around and I'll make an intention to move my dream body through that portal and I'll go through this, this amazing ride through the portal and I'll pop out in some crazy dream that I didn't intend it's it's just it's really a phenomenal experience